Hello and welcome to the to, to the 2020 2022 National Ron White Convention Conference on HIV Care and Treatment Session 20594. Women Informing Now, a two-year retrospective. Reducing Isolation and Stigma Among Women of Color with HIV. My name is Monica Sibbles and I'm a project officer for the HIV Bureau, Division of Community Aid, HIV AIDS and Program. And we thank you for joining us today. As you, as you, as you participate in this session, please feel free to add, add your questions or comments in the chat box. At the conclusion of this session, the presenters will have the opportunity to address your questions. So let's begin. We can't hear the speaker. Richard, are you able to start the um, recording over? Um, the audio for some reason isn't coming through. I'll start it over. Thank you. We still can't hear. sure everyone knows that Michelle nor I have any relevant financial interests. So something's wrong with the recording. Welcome to the session, Women Informing Now, a two-year retrospective reducing isolation and stigma among HIV positive women of color. I am Dr. Ivy Turnbull, Deputy Executive Director of AIDS Alliance for Women, Infants, Children, Youth, and Families by my colleague, Michelle Skevnicki, Associate Executive Director of the AIDS Institute in Tampa, Florida. Um, just to make sure everyone knows that Michelle nor I have any relevant financial interests, 
I am a member of the Office of AIDS Research Advisory Council. At the conclusion uh, of this activity, the learning objectives for this session are as follows. One, identify new models that expand supportive networks of cis and transgender women of color with HIV, improve knowledge of HIV prevention, care, and treatment, and enhance leadership skills among cis and transgender women of color with HIV. The second learning objective is to describe social networks of support, engagement, and trust among cis and trans women of color living with HIV. And finally, discuss the innovative approaches implemented to reduce isolation and stigma among cis and transgender women of color living with HIV engaged or not currently engaged in care. With that said, I'd like to begin by providing an overview of the Women Informing Now, or WIN, as you will hear me refer it to, uh, it throughout the presentation, uh, microgrant initiative. The, the funding for the Women Informing Now uh, microgrant project is provided by Vive Healthcare Positive Actions AMP Grants. This initiative is a two-year microgrant initiative um, designed to support community-based organizations and leaders conducting innovative approaches that break down isolation and stigma experienced by women of color living with HIV across the gender spectrum. What will be presented here to you today or years one of this funding cycle and year two of this funding cycle. In year one, the funding amounts ranged from $3,000 to $4,000. So these are very small micro grants. And in year two, while we had the ability to increase the funding for the micro grants, they are still relatively small. And they ranged from $3,000 to $5,000. The picture on the right of your screen is the logo that we had created for this WIN project. And it's for primarily our grantees to identify the work performed under this initiative. The goals of the project were um, the, each, the micro grants that the micro grant program that we decided or we designed was to actually design innovative strategies to engage cis and trans women of color with HIV, expand supportive networks of cis and transgender women of color with HIV to reduce stigma and isolation, engage cis and transgender women of color with HIV to address barriers to care, increase the engagement of cis and trans women of color with HIV across the HIV prevention and care mm -hmm. continuum, and to develop leadership among cis and trans women of color with HIV to ensure engagement and retention in quality primary care and supportive services. The review and the scoring process consisted of designating priority areas across the country with the highest burden of HIV as highlighted in the ending the HIV epidemic a plan for America. Our review committee was made up of individuals with expertise in program design uh, to, and, uh, that, to provide HIV prevention, care, and treatment services for women with HIV. We used three main scoring criteria, which included innovation, replication, and impact. Over the course of the two years, we funded totally 29 micro grant projects. The first year we funded 13 projects. And the second year we were able to expand our reach and we funded 16 projects across the country. 
this slide just gives you an idea of the regions and the states in each of those regions that were identified under the ending the HIV epidemic plan. And those are the states and the regions that we use as our pri priority areas. As mentioned in year one, the micro grant geographic areas or regions consisted of, we funded two projects in the Midwest, two projects in the West, and nine projects in the South, totaling 13 projects for year one. We have to make a note here, however, and that note is that we did not receive any applicant proposals for the Northeast region in year two. In year, I mean, excuse me, not in year two, in year one. In year two, we funded a total of 16 projects. Those projects consisted of two in the Northeast, which, you know, we expanded our reach because we did not have any proposals submitted in year one from the Northeast. East, two in the Midwest, two in the West, and 10 in the South. The map provides a visual, visual of the projects funded and their locations by state for both year one and year two. I'd like to just present to you by name and region the projects that we funded in year one, the 13 projects. And those projects consisted of Chicago Women's AIDS Project, which in Chicago, Illinois, Christie's Place, which was located in San Diego, California, Institute of Women and Ethics Studies in New Orleans, Louisiana, Legacy Counseling Center in Dallas, Texas, Let's Beehive in Orlando, Florida, Love Me Unlimited for Life in Jackson, Mississippi, Midland Cares in Oakland County, uh, excuse me, Midland Cares in Oakland Park, Florida, Palmetto AIDS Life Support Services in Columbia, South Carolina, Positive Efforts, Houston, Texas, Radiant Health Center, Irvine, California, Transfusions that was located in Dallas, Texas, Unified HIV Health and Beyond, Detroit, Michigan, and Unspoken Treasure Society in uh, Broca, Florida. In year two, as mentioned earlier, we expanded the number of grantees and expanded the geographic areas to include a family affair, living our best lives in Orangeburg, South Carolina, Aid Service Center of Lower Manhattan, Alliance for Positive Change, New York, New York, Chicago Women's AIDS Project, Chicago, Illinois, Columbus Wellness Center Outreach and Prevention Project, Columbus, Georgia, Hype to Empower, Atlanta, Georgia, Hawaii Island HIV Foundation in Hilo, Hawaii, Legacy Counseling Center in Dallas, Texas, Orisha Healing Arts Wellness and Spiritual Center in Memphis, Tennessee, Partnership to End AIDS Status also in Memphis, Tennessee, Radiant Health Centers in Irvine, California, Shaping Health Equities in Baltimore, Maryland, Sojourner House, Providence, Rhode Island, Positive Experience in Memphis, Tennessee, Transsocial, Miami, Florida, Unspoken Treasure Society, Gainesville, Florida, and We Think for a Change in Cleveland, Ohio. Our grantee profiles are quite unique in that the majority of the WIND projects are actually led by cis or transgender women of color. The organizations are also um, interesting across the spectrum because those organizations consist of community-based organizations with 501c3 status, community-based organizations without 501c3 
C3 status, but those organizations are using fiscal sponsors. The projects that uh, they created are cis and trans women focused projects. The projects are also located in both rural and urban service areas. And for several, many, several of our grantees, this is the first time they received funding to implement their innovative strategies designed to reduce stigma and isolation of cis and transgender women of color. With that said, several of them over the course of two years have been able to leverage their WIN microgrant funding to secure new and or additional funding for their projects. At this time, I would also want to share with you six innovative project strategies implemented during year one and year two. And I'll go through them by project name. So Palmetto AIDS Life Support Services, which was located in South Carolina, implemented a therapeutic storytelling intervention called the Red Chair Diaries. And that intervention chronicled the personal experience of cis and transgender women living with HIV. Transfusion, which is located in Dallas, Texas, used a radio platform to break down silos among transgender populations and educated members of the trans community about the importance of living healthy lifestyles. The Institute of Women and Ethnic Studies in New Orleans conducted an initiative called Out of the Shadows that addressed issues of isolation and stigma among cis and trans women living with HIV. Our project in Hawaii, Hawaii Island HIV Foundation, created a virtual community using elements of the evidence-based sister project. Shaping Health Equities in Baltimore, Maryland, conducted listening tours across the Baltimore, Maryland area, and also did sexual health needs assessment surveys. They also, in uh, part of their innovation, was also to distribute sexual health boxes, which they call speed boxes, uh, across the region. And finally, uh, TransSocial, which is located in Miami, Miami, Florida, provided a trauma-informed wellness and advocacy coach to evaluate and stabilize provider-patient relationships. At this point in time, I'm going to turn the presentation over to my colleague, Michelle Skavnicki, who will provide program data for the initiative over two years. Michelle will also talk about the impact and the challenges of COVID-19 on the projects over the course of two years. And then she and I will come back together and highlight the innovative strategies and impact of four of the projects funded during year one and year two of the WIN initiative. Michelle? Thank you, Dr. Turnbull. Now we will highlight specific program data from the WIN microgrant initiative. I would like to begin by demonstrating that the race and ethnicity of the participants primarily served by the WIN micrograntees was Black and African American at 58.8%, and secondly, was both Hispanic and Latino other and Hispanic, Latino, Black, and African American at 10.4% respectively. Although the WIND projects may have identified women of other races and ethnicities, the majority of the women served aligned very closely with the original WIND project goals. Next, I would like to present the age of the women served by the WIND micrograntees. Here you will see that 41.5% were adult cis women ages 25 to 55. The next highest age group of women served were adult cis women over 55 at 16.9%, demonstrating the increased need to remain focused on our aging population. Finally, 
16.3% were among the young adult trans women ages 18 to 24, and 12.8% were among adult trans women ages 25 to 55, again, reflective of the overall WIN project goals. Now I would like to share the overall number of women with HIV, women of color with HIV served by the WIN micrograntees. Here you will see the breakdown by year one and year two. As Dr. Turnbull explained earlier, the focus of the WIND project was to design innovative strategies to engage cis and trans women of color with HIV. The WIND project was successful in identifying 69 newly diagnosed cis women and 64 newly diagnosed trans women over the course of the two-year project period. In addition, 2,745 women of living color living with HIV were served by the project during that same time frame. The data is self-reported by the WIN micrograntees and could possibly include duplicated numbers. The initiative was also remarkably successful because the WIN micrograntees reported six significant behavioral and health changes among their project participants. More specifically, there were 380 women who reported an increased engagement in their participation in women living with HIV support groups, while there were 290 women who reported reduced feelings of isolation due to their HIV status, and lastly, there were 394 women who shared feelings of reduced internalized stigma. The behavioral and health changes identified were considerable and strategically aligned with the overall WIN project goals. Now I would like to discuss the impact of COVID-19 on the WIN micrograntees program implementation, particularly in year one and what changes were made. As COVID-19 became more visible in 2020, all WIN micrograntees were asked a few questions around the impact of COVID-19 on their original proposed projects and if they would still have the capacity to achieve the goals of their approved proposals. And if so, how would they adjust their plan or timeline given the safe at home, social distancing, and quarantine guidelines. Then we asked them to describe what adjustments or changes occurred and if their program would include a virtual or online presence. Most projects, as you see from this slide, shifted from in-person programming to virtual programming immediately. However, not only was this a challenge for project participants, but there was also an unknown learning curve from the provider's perspective, not having much experience using the online learning platforms that existed, such as Zoom, WebEx, Microsoft Teams, et cetera. Other barriers to the virtual space were around lack of privacy or identifying a safe space among project participants, and therefore became more of a, a challenge um, for them to conduct one-on-one -on -one sessions or actively participate in support group activities. This allowed the AIDS Institute the opportunity to further assist the WIN micrograntees with additional capacity building opportunities or technical assistance training needs to address the unforeseen barriers. Now we would like to introduce four WIN micrograntees who conducted innovative strategies and then share the highlights of their impact from receiving two full years of project funding. First, I will introduce Chicago Women's AIDS Project. CWAP service area covers Cook County in Chicago, Illinois. CWAP started the first support group for women in Chicago in 1988, and now they provide case management, support, and advocacy. Kathy Cristaliar is the executive director, and Women Surviving and Thriving is the name of the project that was funded by WIN. During the COVID-19 pandemic, CWAP pivoted from in-person groups to virtual support helping women stay informed, find food, find a therapist, and stay connected to each other. CWAP's innovative strategy included the development of an online virtual support network, which then expanded the project's ability to reach isolated, underserved, cisgender and transgender women of color living with HIV across the entire Cook County region. CWAP successfully held over 100 virtual support groups, conducted 250 outreach calls, and held multiple indoor meetings or outdoor meetings and distributed safety supplies to help these women stay connected, understand how to find resources during this time, especially through COVID, and how to get vaccinated. 99% of their network was vaccinated. In a city where only 40% of Black cisgender women are virally suppressed and engaged in care, CWAP 
was able to help their members stay in care, identify resources, and recognize the importance of engaging in personal support during an exceedingly grim time navigating dual pandemics. One additional note is that CWEP was significantly successful and able to recruit three new peer leaders who have taken charge of the planning and execution of their women support groups. The next organization I would like to highlight is Legacy Counseling Center doing business as Legacy Carers. Legacy Cares is located in Dallas, Texas, and their mission, their mission is to provide affordable and quality mental health care, substance abuse treatment, housing services, and education to people impacted by HIV and AIDS. Dr. Ratanya Runnels is the GRACE Project Coordinator and leads their WIN-funded innovative strategies. Legacy GRACE Project successfully launched an anti-stigma campaign, I Am Red, to foster community conversations about I HIV and the realities of women of color living with HIV, helping to reduce stigma and isolation among these women. In addition, the GRACE Project hosted the Mental Health Marathon, which was a one-day event that included sessions from therapists and community partners focused on mental health, substance abuse, self-care, and activities such as journaling. In 2020, the event shifted to a virtual event due to COVID-19, and in 2021, they hosted the in-person event, but required vaccination for all attendees. The impact was that participants were able to come together in a safe environment to discuss substance abuse and mental health issues of women living with HIV and how and why to disclose their HIV status. Participants also learned new self-care techniques, such as breathing exercises and journaling. One unexpected outcome was that engagement in weekly process groups steadily increased following the mental health marathons. Legacy feels that by providing holistic opportunities for engagement, this has aided in allowing the women to engage on a more intimate and personal level. Now I will turn it back over to Dr. Trimble to share the additional WIN micrograntees that received two years of WIN funding to demonstrate their project impact. Dr. Trimble? I'm going to tell you a little bit about Radiant Health Center. Radiant Health Centers, located in Irvine, California, provide services to the LGBTQ community that are compassionate and comprehensive. Dr. Acosta, who leads the WIND project at Radiant Health Center, actually implemented this innovative strategy called Juntos Pomidos, which is Together We Can, which is a culturally appropriate trans woman of color support group facilitated by a trans woman therapist of color. The intervention provided psychological services needed to improve the quality of life of these individuals and reduce stigma and isolation. The overall impact uh, this uh, innovative initiative actually enhanced the participants' personal and in-group identity, encouraged positive self-appraisal, and affirmed their experience as transgender individuals. In addition, it empowered participants who suffered from anxiety and depression to seek care, as well as decreased depression and anxiety in 90% of the support group's members. And this was measured by the Beck Depression and Anxiety Inventory that was administered to uh, the participants over the course of their uh, engagement in this project. One of the things that Dr. Costa always says about, you know, this WIN microgrant uh, funding is that it is funding that really contributes to the improving of the lives of cis and transgender women who are often neglected in this HIV world. And she asked that, you know, not only we continue the work, but that others begin to um, look at the services that they provide to these women and actually give them services and resources that will benefit them greatly. The other organization that I'd like to present to you today is Unspoken Treasure Society. 
Un Unspoken Treasure Society has three chapters in Gainesville, Florida, Jackson, Florida, and Atlanta. Unspoken Treasure Society is dedicated to finding solutions to the needs of the transgender and gender non-conforming community. In order to accomplish this, their innovative strategy actually formalized a network of trans service providers in North Central Florida to conduct virtual learning groups and social media campaigns to confront stigma. One of the unique things about Unspoken Treasures was that they also launched uh, the Unifying Women of Color uh, initiative, which was an initiative to unify cisgender and transgender women of color living with HIV through creating healing spaces. They conducted educational and actually created a fellowship that uh, among these two different groups that um, broke down stigma and isolation among the groups. The impact of these initiatives was that information got disseminated on safety and self-preservation, COVID-19, PEP and PrEP, which enabled trans women of color who were not connected in care to engage with medical providers. In addition to that, the Unifying Women of Color uh, strategy actually helped participants develop skills necessary to forge sustaining positive relationships among cis and transgender women of color. Um, Unspoken Treasures happens to be one of several of the organizations that actually took this micro grant funding and was able to leverage it uh, to gain uh, additional funding. And their additional funding comes from directly from Vive um, Healthcare. Um, and one of the things that I also like to share with the audience is that amplifying the voices of these projects is critical to the overall success and impact of these initiatives. Establishing learning networks, which we have and continue to do, keeps the grantees connected in that they are able to share program success and challenges exchange ideas and build relationships among a specific cohort of service providers. And that is one of the things that we are most proud of our work with this WIN initiative is that we have been able to create this learning network and sustain those relationships among these service providers. And it has proved proven to be quite rewarding over the uh, past two years. And finally, what I would say ending uh, is that we are happy to report that we have received continued funding to support microgrant initiatives and for an additional three years. This just past year, we just finished, you know, providing funding for 21 projects. And they include micro grantees, community based organizations, but they also include innovative leaders who have been doing work in their communities that uh, they have not been able to receive funding for. And they have gotten funding for that works that we deemed to be innovative and uh, engaging that has an impact and that they can replicate as they move forward with um, working with this specific cis and transgender population of women living with HIV to ensure that those individuals are connected and receive quality health care. I'd like to thank you for your participation uh, in this session. For more information about the WIN microgram programs, 
please visit us and I put our site there, or you can contact me directly at my email address, or you can contact Michelle Skepnicki at uh, her email address, which is also located in this slide. Um, I guess now we'll move forward for question and answers. And after the question and answer period, I also want to show this last slide that if you are uh, would like to receive continuing education credits for this activity, please visit ryanwhite.cds.pesgce.com. Thank you very much. Okay, before we begin our question and answer session, we would like to thank our presenters for this timely and interesting topic. At this time, we will pose questions from the attendees that we've been collecting throughout the session. So the first, the first um, question is not a question, it's a comment. And the comment is from Megan. And she said, thank you for out highlighting out of the shadows in your presentation. And the second question is from Danielle. What project did Let's Beehive in Orlando, Florida implement? I think Michelle, you probably answered that in the um, chat, but yes. just to pose a question so everyone else will you know, know the answer and hear the question. Be good to know what, so the, is, it, is that Beehive in Orlando, Florida? Yes, they had provided several innovative uh, approaches. Uh, they did a few things in the virtual space. They did shift to that as well during COVID. Um, and most of it was around messaging and doing uh, some internalized stigma, um, looking at fear, shame, anxiety, um, and promoting different messaging around the HIV awareness anti-stigma campaign. Great, thank you. And I did add our uh, emails in the chat as well, uh, since we lost the screen, <laughs> but it looks like it's back. Okay, one more question here from um, Watkins. For those organizations that were participating in the WIN grant program, were there any negative outcomes due to the pandemic? And how did this organizations manage these, and how did the organization manage the, manage the issues? Dr. Turnbull, you're on mute. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't use the term negative. What I would use is challenging. And yes, there were some very, very challenging um, issues, particularly when their projects were in person and they had to focus and turn switch to being virtual. Um, we worked very closely with them to um, overcome those challenges. Were they were they perfect? No. Were they measures that allowed them to continue the operation of their projects? Yes. So some of that stuff, particularly when you know it was direct service to women, you know, as Michelle had put up on the slide, was that. One of the things we sometimes forget is, you know, the simple cell phone. So I may not have a lot of minutes on my cell phone to stay in conversation with you for an hour activity. So those are the kinds of things that we had to, you know, help our grantees with and our grantees work with their clients with. They could not have had private spaces because we were all on lockdown. So what did that look like? Not only for the organization that was providing the care, but for the individual as well. So they had to come up with, you know, those kinds of strategies. Either those activities were postponed or there were places or strategies that were thought of how we could reinvent or modify that specific activity for each one of you know those for that particular session where the issues around privacy were 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 real issues uh maybe some of the one of our grantees said well you know one of their clients actually had wound up in the bathroom talking on the cell phone in a whisper so yeah the challenges were great um 
the grantees in and of themselves worked very, very hard uh, to overcome many of those challenges. And for that, you know, we are enormously appreciative. Okay, so for the, from, from Janice Jameson, what was included in the she boxes that were discussed in the presentation? The she boxes, they had information in the she boxes. They had um, condoms in the she boxes, uh, male and female condoms. They had a uh, test, uh, you know, COVID test in the she boxes. So anything that related to, you know, when you go to make those, uh, when you're doing a health fair, uh, those, she, those kinds of things were in the she boxes as well as educational materials that, you know, that group of um, women who they outreach to didn't necessarily, you know, have access to at that time. Okay, last question from Shanae Brantley. How or where did programs apply for the WIN grants? Oh, uh, we actually put out an RFP. How, how, how or where? Oh, do how or where did programs apply for the WIN grants? Oh, we actually released an RFP, mm -hmm. and that RFP went out to all of those respective regions. It was a call for funding opportunity, and um, people who saw that we sent it to networks, and those networks forwarded to other people, and um, that's how we got those responses. Right. Well, we want to thank you to everyone for participating today. And as part of the Bureau's effort to provide you with timely topics and interesting speakers, we appreciate you filling out the session evaluations at the end of each session. If you are seeking continuing education credits, please complete the additional evaluation for credit. To access these evaluations, please return to the session page within the platform and click on the blue evaluation links. Thank you again for joining. Uh, before we leave, I just see one last question where it says, will there be a new RFP? The yes. answer is That's yes. Okay. Thank yeah, you the so answer much. is yes. There will be a new RFP that we'll be releasing either the end of this year, the early, the beginning of next year. Yes. Right. So the answer is yes. Thank you so yes. much, Dr. Turnbull. And thank you so much, Michelle. Absolutely. Oh, I included the so link much. in the chat as well. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have an interesting, excellent rest of the conference.